you know, it's obvious that we look at the two beds and that the, the shortfall is made up in some, in some way. In terms of HAP, again, it's back to the, 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 the different areas. I know in West Cork, for example, it can be increasingly hard um, to access landlords that are willing to engage in the HAP programme, no matter what kind of incentives are put their way. Um, again, in Limerick, I know that HAP, there are over a thousand people in receipt of HAP. Rent, uh, our, um, rent supplement scheme isn't being provided now to any new new applicants. They're all directed toward HAP. And whilst it is welcome, the, 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 the um, availability of HAP, again, it's back to the availability of private rented. And I think it's only as good as the supply of private rented and HAP, you know, depends on people being able to access units of private rented accommodation. So, um, again, it depends on how available those units are. Yeah, we found that actually because an awful lot of landlords are not interested in taking HAP. Yeah. Like, there's huge issues around it, but I have seen it work and work well. You know, so it, it definitely needs to be rejigged because you know, in in, the, in principle, when you look at it, the landlord is is is, is guaranteed his rent, and and then the the tenant, you know, the the tenant is more secure from that point of view. You know, the, the, and um, so yeah, like HAP comes up an awful lot because, as you said, they're directing people towards HAP now as a against the rent supplement, you know. So thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Deputy Quinlevan. Thanks. Um, just one or two queries there. We're talking about HAP, we might as well go on with that one. We have it in Limerick, as, as you're well, well aware, and it works quite well in parts of Limerick, but it doesn't work as well in the city because the, the rent limits are just too low. Now, you say, you say in, your, in, in your document there that... Um, 15% is not enough to increase their rent supplement, and do you have a, a suggested figure you would come up with? You might come back to me on that one. Um, you also talk about two beds for one person. I think this is crucially important as well. That, you know, sometimes a person needs support, somebody stay with them every now and again, or would, would have a child that wouldn't necessarily be on their application, but would be their child, and that they, they could stay with them as well. And obviously they can't act, they can't rent a two-bedroom apartment on a HAP scheme, you know, when the limit's 375 and they're not allowed to rent a two-bedroom one. And you talk about your housing force policy that you have in Limerick, and you say there's no social houses available for that policy. Would that be houses that you would hope to deliver yourself, or would it be for local authority houses you were hoping would come on stream? And the other thing is your family, your intensive family support. You might just explain it to the committee what that is. I know exactly what it is, because we deal with it in my own constituency office probably every single day. I think it's actually a fantastic facility. And what most of us here are very concerned about is not so much, so much the amount of people who are homeless, but those who, who will become homeless. And I think the intensive family support service that you do offer in, in Limerick and other places, I'm sure, prevents an awful lot of that. And, you know, it kind of heads off of the past, so you might just clarify that a small bit. Um, in terms Deputy. of the increased payment, sorry, thank you, uh, Deputy Quinlevin. Um, in terms of the increased um, HAP payment, um, the HAP uh, homeless pilot uh, provides um, uh, limits up to 50% more than the rent supplement, so we would think that would work. In Limerick, a one-bed apartment <coughs> costs between about, in on a DAF search, would be 550 and 750 or 850. Um, and then, like, if the cap is 375, like 15% more than that will not work. So we'd, we'd recommend about 50% more would work. Um, in terms of the two beds, yeah. Um, we, yeah, the social housing for the housing first, sorry, we would re we would like to get it from uh, local authority stock, but also we would be interested in purchasing it ourselves. But we need the guarantee that if we buy two beds that we can put single individuals in there, and then we actually will engage in the process of acquiring that property immediately. I mean, do you want to talk about the IFS? Um, Absolutely. The Intensive Family Sports Service, it's up and running um, 11 years now, and Basically, it's a preventative service, it's a tenancy sustainment service for families who may be at risk of homelessness or who are actually homeless. So um, we work with families very often that are at a crisis point um, in their own homes, in their private rented, and try and put a preventative plan in place so that they don't actually become homeless or so that they can keep the accommodation they're in. Very often that's working with the mum and dad around their... Um, 
their, their, their issues, maybe linking in with social worker, advocating on their behalf if they're already engaged with social workers, um, assisting them to, to, to conferences with social workers, um, assisting them very often to access visits if their children are, if they're estranged from their children, and as well as that supporting mum or dad to, you know, all the different life skills that one needs to maintain their accommodation. Um, we would link them in with addiction services, waste treatment services, with MABs. So it depends on the, 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 I suppose, the complex issues that any family is facing. Um, we, pro we provide an individual package of support tailored to that family to support them to remain in their accommodation or if it's at that point, that crisis point where they've let, lost their accommodation to access further accommodation for them, be it private rented um, or, so, or social housing, but actually more often than not it is private rented. And it is getting increasingly harder to respond in the preventative scope in that now more often than not we've, we've moved towards crisis management in that we have a, a long list of families that are waiting to receive a service from us. That's a new departure for us and that, that's not something we faced um, even three or four years ago. We now have a waiting list at any one time of over 30 families sitting on that waiting list waiting to, um, to engage with our service. So it is um, a very powerful service in terms of the tenant sustainment and the homeless prevention bit, but it needs to be, I think, um, well resourced in terms of the numbers that are coming to the service right now looking for, for support. I think there is a huge issue in terms of the increasing number of families that are becoming homeless now and it is an issue outside of Dublin as well. Um, and like I said, we're seeing it increase quite rapidly in Limerick. Um, as well as that, it is the only out-of-hours service in the city in that when the social work departments, when the homeless um, office or the, the homeless action team office closes in the evening, we provide an out-of-hours service. So if somebody, whether they're a family or a single person, finds themselves homeless in the city at night um, or needs to access information or accommodation, our family support service is an out-of-hours service that, that, that can be accessed. So it is kind of, it tries to be as um, wrap around, I guess, as possible in terms of if you find yourself um, homeless during the day or the night or whatever the case may be, you need to access B&B, &B, it's done to that out of our service. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask Dr Burns one particular question. In your opening, one of the areas of concern to the committee um, is in prevention of people becoming homeless. And uh, in your opening s statement, I, you made a comment, and I just wanted to, to, you might explain a little bit more. We had the Department of Social Protection here recently, and, did, and they indicated that community welfare officers were supporting uplifts in rent, and they gave a figure of maybe 8,000 cases last year, and it'll be more than that this year. Uh, and the community welfare officers understood the risk of homelessness and were acting uh, responsibly to the requests from people who are finding themselves in this situation, and we talked about people, you know, who were paying top-up payments and so forth. In your, if, I, if I'm correct in what you said, you're saying some community welfare officers are not doing that. Would you explain a little bit more, that's please? Correct, Dan. Because that's that's a real risk. Yeah. Of, uh, it's, of course, you can. Yes. Definitely. Quick question on that one. We actually raised our wish issue at that, at that meeting, and the concern we had was the HAP payments weren't enough, and there, were, there was a facility to raise that. And they confirmed that in Limerick it was only seven times they've done that. So I don't know if that's the experience you get, because we know no one gets it. Yeah, yeah, so, and it was it was regionally, it was in Limerick that we were referring to this particular yes, no, issue, please. and um, our intensive family support service have worked, um, and we were only actually having this conversation with the manager of the, of the service yesterday, and um, in terms of, um, the, I suppose, in their response to the, to the crisis, they've kind of divided the team at the moment to cr uh, crisis management, tenancy sustainment, and um, uh, life skills. And uh, in the crisis management and the prevention, sorry, in the prevention side, then they have people coming and saying that they are at risk of homelessness due to the economic reasons that their income doesn't meet rent demands. And they've gone to their CWO and that the HAP, uh, uplift hasn't, has been denied. Now, in all instances that that has happened, um, then our, our team have gone to the CWO in the Homeless Action Team um, attached to Limerick uh, City and County Council. And then at that level, it's been, it's been given. So that the, through our intervention, the families haven't become homeless. But for all the families, there are families then who have become homeless as a result of not pursuing it with yourselves. Uh, that, I'm not. Uh, now they may well be, but I, I'm not aware of them. But that is the risk that families that may not know that we exist or that haven't presented to us that have been denied. The, this they may have become homeless, and they may come and actually present then. 
as homeless instead of as a prevention case. So, like, I mean, obviously it makes sense if, you're, if you can uplift the HAP to keep them in their own home rather than putting them into a significant number of cases that's been referred to you? Um, I, I think, actually, uh, Deputy Quinlivan, you probably know more in number that if there's only seven that have been uplifted, then there yeah, must be a significant I, number. What was the answer we got from the CWO when they're here? It sounds it, because it, it was actually, I was concerned that she was saying it was freely available and if you come to the clinic, it, you get it sorted out because that wasn't the experience that any of us, it wasn't just myself who was saying that everybody has to, had agreed with that one. Mm. There wasn't much of an uplift there. She confirmed seven because I asked her twice and that's in the minutes. She did confirm seven uplifts in Limerick, so, and I do know, and I, we have, I have never got an uplift, uplift for somebody who we've went to CWO. CWO yeah. in Limerick don't allow a TD or a public representative to go in with the person there, and obviously most of those persons going there are vulnerable and should be accompanied by somebody. Yeah, I'm not anticipating a report, but it is important that, you know, the preventative measures that are supposed to operate, that that we're not That's why I raised, I raised the question about the intensive family support because I think it's an excellent service and it does prevent people becoming homeless and I think it's very important that it's funded because if you're saying now, which is quite concerning, that you have a waiting list of 30, I understand why you have the waiting list but that's, a, that's an issue and where we, well you need to be helped with. As well as that the service is designed to support 50, 40 families a month and since um, January it's supporting 50 so it's operating at 125% capacity and a waiting list of about 25 or 30. Now, by dividing the team in the last few weeks, it's kind of giving people some kind of a service immediately, even if it's just a phone call. And if it's a case that all they need is our intervention with CWOs, then we can do that with a phone call, you know, when you're preventing it. But yeah, it's never been, even through the, the years of the depression and the decline, that was never as, as in demand as it is now. Just ch Chairman, a, there's a related issue. We, we, there is a format of housing we use, particularly for, uh, it's a small cohort of our, of, of our um, service users, residents, and it's where, having gone through short stay accommodation, a, um, living in a, in a group setting may be their preferred and appropriate form of accommodation. And again, there could be issues there with as it were, there's a gradation of, of, of support. The first tenant will, 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 will get a level of allowance, but it, it, but it diminishes with second and third uh, residents. And the issue comes back to, for us, that puts pressure on the funding. Like, our, our ability to provide enhanced estate management and support services in those settings is compromised. There's relatively small amounts of money involved. What it means is that you, you can be in a situation where the resourcing to support that tenant is, uh, is put under pressure. Uh, and th in a lot of cases, the tenants are leading that, or residents are leading that um, desire t to live in a, in, in, a, in a grouped accommodation setting. Um, I think Una made reference as well, the CAF system, which is a system that we have used quite effectively to develop new stock. There, there's, at the minute, CAF, in effect, is, is difficult, if not impossible, to, to be applied to group housing accommodation. I think there is, in, 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 in the groups we deal with, there is a particular benefit if CAF was available in, in, in very specific circumstances for that type of accommodation where it's appropriate to long-term needs for, for residents. Are there any other colleagues? Who, Deputy O'Sullivan. We've been looking particularly at uh, vulnerable, very vulnerable groups today, like people who are coming out of prison, uh, people who are in addiction. But there's one other group, and I've worked with a group in Dublin here, and you mentioned it in your report, and I just asked if you could fill us in a bit more on the work you're doing, and that is crisis pregnancy. Women who are pregnant and are homeless. Uh, not necessarily with an addiction issue as well, because um, I'm inter interested in what you're, the support you're giving there. Just to, we don't actually have a dedicated crisis preg pregnancy service. What we do have, I suppose, and what we've seen um, develop at different pockets of time um, are increasing numbers of women in our emergency STA accommodation that would be pregnant or at various stages of pregnancy. And it is quite um, risky in terms of their accommodation and the support needs they require. Um, and I suppose very often the, the most particular or the highest risk cases are when the woman is active in her, in her addiction. And I think that's the most complex um, challenge that we would face then. So what we've, we've put it in our submission because we wanted to highlight it as a particularly um, serious challenge. And I think it's not something that um, we see as 
spiking at all times, but it does spike at different times, and when it does, it really, it, you know, it, it proved challenging. So what we've asked is that there is a dedicated crisis midwife available that has that specific set of skills that can support us. Um, it, we do have a very skilled staff team, but like many of our other colleagues around, you know, the other voluntary community groups, it's not necessarily staffed with clinical um, staff. So we would certainly look for a dedicated um, um, midwife in that region that would kind of support us at times and other service providers too that would work with females um, that have a crisis pregnancy and would either be active in their addiction, would have an enduring mental health need, very often there might be a learning disability or you know some other kind of issue that might um, reduce capacity. I think it is key in terms of that woman's transition through accommodation and homeless services and what you don't want to happen is um, women having their babies and returning to ST or emergency type accommodation. I think that really is an absolute, it's such, uh, you know, an awful outcome um, and one that is very detrimental obviously to the woman, to the baby, to the staff that are trying to support her. So I think it is a unique kind of um, challenge and something that does need attention. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, at this stage that concludes uh, questions. I'd like to thank you for your attendance, your presentation first of all, and your attendance and the response to the questions. Um, and I suppose significantly uh, from, and I, I mentioned this to the previous group, uh, from my point of view and say Deputy O'Sullivan in particular, or maybe Deputy Coppinger, we've had a lot of emphasis on Dublin issues. So, you know, listening to the experiences, particularly when we were talking about community welfare officers, how issues have been dealt with in other parts of the country is important for the committee to hear. So thank you very much for your attendance. Um, colleagues, we will now adjourn till next Tuesday morning at 10.30am. Thank you.